So next up is Alan Quayle. Alan has 22 years of experience in the telecommunications industry, focusing on developing profitable new businesses. Uh, customers include a large number of operators, um, but also uh, some, vet, some uh, network vendors uh, and some innovative startups. Uh, he works with the development community and is on the board of developers such as GoToCamera, HCineed Mobile, as well as suppliers such as Sigma Systems. So welcome to Alan. Great, thanks a lot, Kevin. So uh, what I thought I'd do is actually just kick off with, um, before getting into the bulk of this presentation, through basically this morning, there's been some interesting, shall we say, um, assumptions, and I thought I'd just sort of give my perspective on those assumptions. The first is, operators provide quality of service. I'm afraid that's BS. AT&T wasn't working for me today. I've basically been receiving notifications of voicemails that have been left for me on my phone while Skype has been quite happily working. So the quality of service issue, I'm afraid, no, that isn't an advantage you've got. Customer service, have you seen operators' JD Power ratings on customer service? They suck. I positively don't want to call AT&T or Verizon. I end up pissed off. APIs, guys, Developers think your APIs are irrelevant because your business models suck. It's not the technology, it's the business model. Privacy. BT Form, Swisscom, you're always talking about exposing customer data to monetize it. You have no credibility around privacy either. You keep talking about one solution. There is no one solution. I mean, API, one API, again, is a terrible thing in that it says it's one. We have multiple APIs. We're going to have multiple communication solutions out there. All that matters is that you're the one that people are paying for. And then we keep showing these lovely graphs where it's like, oh, no, the over-the-top threat. Look at all those users. Well, actually, for most of those guys, those users are a cost. While if we were to look at it on a revenue basis, you wouldn't even notice them. They'd be like a little bump on the uh, graph. So really, we need to look at things not just from users. And bear in mind, for a lot of those, they're not real users, they're bots. I mean, in the Bay Area, there's basically some services you can use to get you up into millions of customers very quickly. So actually, we need to look at sort of you know, a broader comparison than just num numbers of users. So anyway, I just thought I'd kick off with that to wake you up, because I'm apologizing that I'm keeping you away from uh, lunch. So let me just get into the bulk of what I'm going to talk about. So I've been asked to talk about the over-the-top messaging landscape. I'm going to have a quick review of why the first phase of over-the-top messaging, that is instant messaging, that happened in the 90s and the noughties, didn't kill SMS. And I'm going to review the landscape very briefly. Uh, because we've covered it quite a few times now in the presentations this morning, and then provide you with a perspective on the business models for over the top. So I'm not going to do what Kevin did and talk about page boys, which was a good British way of uh, you know, giving a presentation there. Uh, I'm going to look at the sort of digital instant messaging systems. And that started back in 1961 with the compatible time sharing system, email, 1971. Bulletin board systems. Remember when you used to use your dial-up modem to basically download your pirated software? Then it became a lot easier with Usenet for getting a hold of your pirated software. And then uh, IM systems started to appear and get significant use. My first experience of using IM was with Quantum Link with the Commodore 64. And that's the user experience of Quantum Link. You clicked on People Connect connection, and you were able to chat with the other uh, connected uh, Commodore 64 users. And that's just so you remember what the Commodore 64 looked like. 64K, that was my first home computer. I loved it. Then in the 90s, we saw a whole range of silos appear. America Online, Yahoo IM, ICQ, MSN, Google Talk, all focused on creating their own little silos. Why? Because it's free. And when it's free, you have to lock in. And I'll come back to why that lock-in when it's free is so important. And of course, what's happened is because none of them interoperated, basically the world moved on. And a lot of the people that were using MSN or AOL or Yahoo IM, I'm sure we all had them running on our desktop, have actually sort of converged onto Skype because Skype actually gave us a whole lot more. 
And that wasn't just IM, it was basically yeah, calling to any phone on the planet, as well as uh, messaging to any phone on the uh, planet, and that great thing, video chat. But unfortunately, Skype got bought by Microsoft, and Microsoft's doing what it is, always does to things and making it a pain to use. Basically, I'm sure if anybody's out there that uses Skype regularly will recognize basically the fact that the service has been pretty crap over the last three or four months with basically uh, the um, voice ending up unrecognizable. So what happens? We move to other over-the-top services. So uh, we already had uh, from Ericsson a WebRTC uh, uh, presentation. There's quite a few services out there already using WebRTC. I've been using 10 hands. It's great. Frisbee is really cool. On my web blog, you'll see a list of companies doing really cool web RTC uh, services that basically can come in and replace Skype. Now, one point I do want to highlight is IM does interoperate, but it's all about the business model. It's nothing to do with technology. Jabba basically uh, created XMPP, which enabled interoperable uh, IM. And it happens, it exists today. Microsoft, IM, Cisco, WebEx, all interoperate. Why? Because the enterprise is paying. The business model is very different here. It's not free and locking people in. An analogy I use to help understand why, when it's free, it's all about lock-in, is here. I show a uh, cartoon of Facebook and you. If you're not paying for it, then you're not the customer. You're the product being sold. And if you're the farmer, and you've got your pigs in your shed, you don't want your pigs going off to basically another farmer's shed. And that's basically uh, why uh, they want to keep you within that silo. And they don't want to have interoperable silos, because it enables that other farmer to potentially slaughter your pigs and monetize them. Now looking at a little bit of history, uh, Kevin already made reference to this, but just a little bit more uh, detail on SMS and its success. First text message, or telenote, as it was called, was sent back on the 3rd of December, 1992, by Neil Patworth to his colleagues in Vodafone, wishing them a Merry Christmas. Commercial service launch took place in 95. Uh, sort of, I was in the UK then. Dean, you were in the UK. It was crap, pointless. You couldn't talk to anybody. You couldn't message anybody, because it was all within BT Cellnet or uh, uh, T-Mobile. It wasn't until 1998 when interconnect between the UK operators happened, and bear in mind that that was possible because customers are paying them, so they can interoperate. The business model isn't free in keeping people trapped within their uh, barns. It's very much about delivering services to customers. So it's a business model difference that enabled operators to do this for both their customers and their own best interest. And the rest, of course, is history. We had, uh, back in April 98 in the UK, about 5 million messages in a month. Then within three years, it was over a billion. And then by uh, December 2002, we were seeing a billion SMS uh, exchanged globally a day. And messaging now is pervasive. I mean, uh, yes, we've got the over-the-top apps, but everything, your Xbox platform, your PS3 network, they've all got messaging capabilities with presence, avatars, and a whole host of social integration. It's everywhere. I show here an example of what happened once iMessage came on, because Apple and Android are the real threats here. With iMessage, it's really insidious. It just substitutes your SMS. And this shows for one customer, Obviously, yeah, he's New York City-based uh, in an inner community where most of his friends also have iPhones. But this shows the massive drop-off in his need for messaging. And what that means is instead of paying 20 bucks a month for an unlimited messaging plan, he pays for the messages he uses. Although, most probably, given the uh, crazy pricing for text messaging, is still paying five or uh, 10 bucks anyway. And then Skype is the dominant international phone service. And for video, it dominates everywhere, you know, basically any other service. Uh, I'm sure we all experience it uh, in using basically Skype to video chat with the granny to keep the kids occupied on a Saturday morning so you get some peace and quiet. I show here a uh, GroupMe, a New York City-based startup built on Twilio, 
uh, and just to basically enables group chat. We've seen it talked about lots and lots of times. Let me show you the reality of their business case. Basically, VCs put lots of money into GroupMe. GroupMe spends lots of money with operators to terminate their SMS. That's basically why they exited. They got basically uh, bought uh, by uh, Skype. And of course, as I already mentioned, Microsoft's bought Skype and is killing it. So just wrapping up, looking at the business models, there's really four major areas. There's hope for re advertising revenue. That is using analytics, advertising. So GroupMe, Voxer, Viber were all in that case. There's hope customers pay for something. That's what Tango's about. Basically, it's got lots of cute video effects, value-added services. It's trying to basically position around its video uh, chat services. Annual fee, uh, calls to or from, uh, the PSDN is where basically Skype makes some of its living. Value for the community, so it's not actually in the service itself, it's in the value it delivers to the community. So that's where Xbox, PS3 live in terms of why they want messaging. And of course you can partner with uh, telco, Skype, WhatsApp, but to be frank, you don't really see that much revenue in terms of usage of the service. What you actually see uh, is most probably you get half a mil uh, for doing some professional services work to get it set up with the operator. So that's really uh, where most of the revenue comes from initially. So they're the business models that exist. It's not an easy existence and we're going to see a lot of churn in all these over the top players. Now don't get me wrong, there are, for example, in Korea, it's a very homogeneous society that tends to basically follow a trend. So you see everybody move en masse into basically uh, one particular platform. A lot of other countries aren't like that. So uh, what we see in Korea isn't necessarily a template for uh, many other countries. So let's just wrap it up so we can get off and have some lunch. So national cross-platform interoperability is essential for customers within your own country, first off. And it's no configuration, no funky pricing, no content adaptation problems, it just works. We can't afford the messy start that we saw with MMS. And that's what we risk at the moment with RCS. It's about transparent interoperability. That's the most important thing an operator can do for their customers to remain relevant. Over the top guys love their silos and will continue to live in those silos, which will always fundamentally limit them. Messaging has just become a feature. We have conversations and relationships. Messaging is just part of that. That's why Apple and what they're doing and potentially yeah, Google, now it's got Motorola and is going to create basically its own competitor to uh, the iPhone, really are the long-term threats. What we're seeing here with some of the uh, over-the-top guys, it's a blip. We basically are going to need to restructure restructure the pricing, react in terms of getting a 20-year-old experience updated to basically uh, the 21st century, but let's face it, it's just taken too damn long to do that. So really, bottom line, an operator's only weapon is cross-carrier interoperability. That's the most important thing that they can do for their customers in terms of remaining relevant, and it isn't one solution, as I mentioned right at the start, over the top is here to stay, and uh, customers are allowed the freedom to choose. So with that, I'm done. OK, thank you very much, Alan, for catching up some time for us. Um, I think you've uh, given us a really thought-provoking presentation. Um, you, you've identified uh, some problems with uh, operators. Um, I won't go into the detail of them, but... The assumptions I, you're making. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's worth thinking about. Um, nobody is 100% reliable. <laughs> um, you've given an interesting history of uh, messaging applications, which is different from the one I gave, which is excellent. Um, you identified that free often relates to lock-in, um, that uh, interoperability can lead to pig theft, uh, that uh, if people pay then interconnect does actually work. But these days, people don't want to pay. That's the problem. Uh, you have a ver had a very interesting chart there, which I think I need to copy and reuse, on the OTT business models. Uh, you identified that OTTs love silos and that cross-carrier interoperation is essential. So with that, uh, before we take lunch, um, are there any questions for Alan?
everyone's hungry. I, I have one question. Do, do you think that um, interoperation, interoperability stops at national boundaries? Um, no, because your, your first the, point yeah, here is that... But that's where we need to focus. So that's why I like what they're doing in Spain. It's get it working in Spain, not on Vodafone between Vodafone's properties. Because actually when you look at your contact list, most of the people are in the same country on average. So get it working nationally first is the most important thing. But that, then that, that in does a depend, region, then globally. That does depend what kind of company you're in. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking at Ed, Ed Tiedemann here, and he, he has guys who work all over the world. So yeah. you know, if he wants to message people, having a, a system that niche, just works in the I'm US. I'm looking at the mass market here. OK. OK. Any more questions? Dean, how does that Dean, we'll just take Dean, and then Ayub, and then we'll, we'll close for lunch. Exactly. Operators have basically been their own worst enemy in terms of roaming fees and international charges. It's been ridiculous. They've maintained them as high as they have done for so long, which has opened the door to over the top. Because if it was all bundled into your plan, you know, because you're paying the operator 100 odd bucks a month, you wouldn't care. You just use it because it was most convenient. So absolutely. Uh, I have a small, small question. Uh, thank you for, for the presentation first, it was very really good. I liked your part, uh, the parts about the analysis of the business uh, models of the different OTTs. I would like to know a little bit more about that because I'm not, I was not sure what kind of conclusion I would draw from this. But for, for example, let's just take Skype for example. I mean, we know that they make more, most of their money with, uh, when they interop with, with actual networks, right? Yeah. Calling a phone, sending an SMS to an actual phone. Uh, but but uh, obviously, what's the future for them? For example, if everybody, if everybody has Skype, then it's free for everyone. And then how, how are they going to monetize, for example? Well, not everybody will have Skype. And I'm not always connected on Skype. Yeah. Okay. So it's basically, it's again, it's that pervasiveness. And you can't force a single choice on people. Why do you choose Rogers versus Bell versus TELUS? People are allowed choice. Choice will exist. You know, Skype is just one solution. And you can see, I mean, basically on your Skype list, you know, I use Skype mainly for business. So it's mainly sort of your business and my close family. That's it. Yeah. But there's a ton on my contact list that most of you do use Skype that don't want me knowing them yeah. on Skype. But, but don't, you, don't you see that their revenues are going to decline as well? Skype? I mean, as, as they go, if everyone, if well, Skype needs to get its, increases. Skype needs to get its act together on a number of fronts. I mean, it is embedding Skype into a whole host of devices. So all the smart connected TVs, all that stuff, it's going to be embedded in there, which is going to be cool. Because then, basically, you can Skype with, granny, with Granny's TV. She doesn't have to have a tablet or a PC or anything like that. So I think that they're doing that right. The enterprise thing, they sort of started and stopped, started and stopped, stopped. If they get that right, so there's lots of potential for revenue growth. And also, if they're linking in with their you know, Microsoft links, so there's opportunity there. It's just basically the operations of their platform at the moment are killing them and basically driving customers away. So I'd actually say it's the operations of uh, Skype, because in the end, it's your user, ex it's the whole user experience. And Skype is sucking at the moment in terms of user experience, which drives people elsewhere. Yeah, it's the it's the cheap Thank infrastructure you. that runs on everybody's your your PC and my PC. Yeah.